Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about chemical reactions and chemical equations and balancing chemical equations, I want to talk a little bit about how it relates to the periodic table and how it relates back to one of our scientific laws um, that was proposed by Antoine Lavoisier, the law of conservation of mass or the law of conservation of matter, which says that whatever you have on one side of a chemical reaction, you have to also have on the other side, right? It may change forms. For instance, in this reaction, I have hydrogen gas on this side, oxygen gas on this side, on my reactant side, and I have water on the other side. But if you look at the numbers, I have the same number and type of element on each side of my reaction. I have four hydrogens on this side, four on this side, two oxygens on this side, two on this side. And that says that whatever it is that I started out with, whatever raw materials I started out with on my reactant side, I will end up with on my product side. That's the law of conservation of mass. And I want to relate this to the periodic table of the elements. So when we look at the periodic table, we have these different squares, and if we have hydrogen here, it's number one on the periodic table, and if you look at the mass of it, the atomic mass, it's roughly one. Sorry, you can't see that very well. If you look at oxygen, it's number eight on the periodic table, and it's got 16 as its atomic mass, and so we said the number at the top here is the atomic number. It's the number of protons in the nucleus. which is unique to each of the elements. And the number here on the bottom, we've defined as the atomic mass. Now, when we defined this before, we said that it is equal to the mass of one atom of this particular element in atomic mass units. And atomic mass units is usually abbreviated AMU, or you'll also see it as just U, kind of the universal mass unit for atoms. And so on a periodic table, we get a lot of information just from one of these squares. You know, here's the symbol, here's the number of protons in the nucleus. The number of protons actually gives you a pretty good indication of how heavy it's going to be, because the mass of the nucleus is basically the mass of the atom itself. The uh, mass of the electrons is very, very teeny tiny and does not account for much of the mass of the overall atom. So I want to talk a little bit about how this relates to our balanced chemical equation, and then we're going to talk about how it relates to one of the most important concepts in chemistry, which is the mole. So let's start off with just our current definition of atomic mass, the mass of one atom. So if the mass of one atom of hydrogen is one AMU, and I have two hydrogens in this particular molecule, then I have 2 AMU worth of mass from just this hydrogen. But I have to take into account the coefficient out here, the big number out front, which tells me how many of these particular um, molecules I have in this reaction. So if I multiply my 2 AMU, which is my two hydrogens, by 2, then that gives me 4 AMU total. Now if I do the same thing with my oxygen, oxygen is 16 AMU, so I only have one of them, times my two that are in there, so that gives me 32 AMU total, and I only have one of them. Remember if there's no number out in the front of my molecule or compound or atom here, if there's no number out front that just means that there's one, so just one times my 32 gives me 32. And if I look at the other side, then I have two hydrogens and one oxygen, so two times my one AMU plus 16, so that's 18 AMU in general. That's for one water molecule. But I have two of them in this particular reaction, so two times my 18 gives me 36 AMU. So what we see then from the periodic table, and I did some rounding here, so forgive the significant figures on this, but I did do some rounding just for con concept's sake. If I start off with hydrogen here, and I have two hydrogen molecules reacting with one oxygen molecule, uh, the total mass on this side of my, re on, of my reaction, of my equation, is 36 atomic mass units, right? Four plus my 32. So overall, my reactant side has a mass of 36.
and then I make two water molecules with 18 AMU each, which means that I have 36 um, AMU worth of mass on my product side. Okay, so it balances out. That's the law of conservation of mass. And we can relate this to the individual masses of all of our atoms. Now this is a little bit misleading because what this atomic mass also tells us is the mass in grams of one mole of these atoms. Mass in grams, which is much more useful in terms of what we can do in a laboratory, of one mole of that element. Element. Sorry, can't spell today. One mole of that element. Okay, so that's the atomic mass. Um, so what that means then is if I have one mole of oxygen, then it is going to weigh 16 grams. Okay, that's what that tells me. This is our new definition of an atomic mass. Now this is much more useful. Grams are much more useful than atomic mass units. Never have I ever had a scale where I could put something on there, I put my pen on there, and it tells me uh, some sort of number in atomic mass units. It's just sort of silly. When we put things on a scale or a balance, it's going to give us information in grams or kilograms or pounds or whatever it is that we're measuring in, right? That gives us some indication of mass or weight if we're here on Earth, etc. So grams is a much more useful uh, way to measure out mass. So let's talk about this one mole action. One mole is the SI unit for how much or how many kind of amount. And chemists use the mole like you and I use a dozen to talk about eggs. I don't talk about, oh, I'm going to go out and get 24 eggs, right? I say I'm going to go out and get two dozen eggs. And it'd be weird to go out and count individual eggs. It's nicer to group them together in groups that make sense. And it doesn't make sense for the people that put together eggs. And a mole makes sense for chemists. And a mole is also called Avogadro's number after Amadeo Avogadro. And he kind of was playing around with gas molecules and gas particles, and he figured out that uh, equal volumes of gas have equal numbers of particles. Now, of course, this has to be um, given constant pressure and temperature because otherwise that can mess with things. So I'll just put that as constant pressure and temperature there. And so Avogadro's law says that equal volumes of gas have an equal number of particles. And these equal number of particles, so he was kind of interested in counting particles, not that he was counting individual atoms because they just didn't have the technology at the time. We barely have that technology now. But what he found is that um, Avogadro's number then, as he's counting these particles, is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and that is equal to one mole. So what he found actually under standard conditions is that 22.4 liters has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd moles of gas particles, and that doesn't really matter, uh, the numbers part of that, but just if you're interested in Avogadro's law, um, Amadeo Avogadro was an Italian chemist and um, he was just kind of an interesting character. He, the uh, significance of his uh, kind of knowledge and the significance of this idea of the mole really wasn't recognized or appreciated until after he died. So they called one mole Avogadro's number after him. So 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, kind of anything. We usually talk about it in terms of particles or atoms or molecules. So we're talking teeny tiny things. But I could have one mole of watermelons, right? So I could have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd watermelons. And that would basically give me, if I have kind of a normal basketball size watermelon, uh, that would basically give me an entire planet of watermelons uh, about equal to the size of Earth. Okay, If I had one mole of pennies, um, so 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd pennies, and I stacked them up 
then it would be basically the diameter of our galaxy, right? So it's just this crazy n large number, and it's really hard to visualize um, unless we relate it to mass, which is what we can do. And we can do this using what is called the molar mass. And this goes back to our second definition of atomic mass. The molar mass of anything is the mass of one mole. Okay, so it's the mass of one mole of that molecule, atom, compound, etc. That's the molar mass. And the mass is in grams, and it's just so useful that way. Okay, so if we're in grams, then we can relate a mass to a number of particles. And, and this can be really useful in terms of calculations and such, but for a kind of a conceptual level, it's really important to understand that we can relate these two quantities um, and we can get this information from the periodic table. And it's just more useful that way. If you think about going to the deli, for instance, and I wanted to get some turkey meat for my sandwiches this week, and then I would go into the deli and I wouldn't say, I want 56 slices of turkey, right? I'd say I want a pound of turkey or I want a half pound of turkey. And so I'm relating the quantity, the number of things that I want to the mass of the things that I'm buying, right? So this is how the molar mass works as well. So if we kind of go back to our, um, our example, if I take a new uh, equation here, if I take carbon and I react it with oxygen and that gives me carbon dioxide And if I go to the periodic table, and I'm just gonna do some rounding again, just for sake of, of things, then I find out that my mass of carbon is basically 12, it's 12.01, but let's just say it's 12 for all intents and purposes. Um, and what we said before is this was the mass of one atom of carbon. But if I wanna talk about this on kind of an industrial scale, if I wanted to actually do this in the lab, I would have to take the mass of these different things and figure out how they relate together. So if I wanted this mass in grams, then I could say, well, one mole of carbon is gonna be 12 grams. And one mole of oxygen is gonna be two times my 16, which is 32 grams. Okay. And then when I add those together, the masses of those two things, when I break apart the bonds with my oxygen and reform bonds for my carbon dioxide, then I end up with the mass of something that's 12 plus two times my 16, which gives me 44 grams. And again, super rounding. So um, if you use your periodic table, you can use it to as many sig figs as there are. Um, for our purposes, I'm just trying to show this conceptually. And again, if we look at the addition here, then my reactant side has a specific mass, the product side has a specific mass, and the law of conservation of mass holds true. So the molar mass then is the mass of one mole of each of these things. And now these coefficients, these big numbers out front, can also give us information about the number of moles reacting in this. Before we said, one atom of carbon reacts with one molecule of oxygen to give me one molecule of carbon dioxide. But we can also say one mole of carbon will react with one mole of oxygen molecules to give us one mole of carbon dioxide. And that one mole of carbon dioxide is gonna have 44 grams. That's gonna be the mass of it, okay? And so it's a really useful number. It's a really useful concept um, and it can kind of give you some information later on when we start doing some real calculations. But just kind of from a theoretical conceptual standpoint, um, this is a good start. And if you have any questions on this, don't hesitate to ask.